Good afternoon. Welcome to the Board of County Commissioners meeting. Today is Thursday, August 2nd, 2018, and we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, Commissioner Stromeyer. One's green. Now that one's green. It likes a double deal. I'll turn that one off. It was just lonesome. <laughs> Are there any public announcements? Western Montana uh, Fair is next week and uh, free admission. Go and have fun. Um, any public comments on items not on today's agenda? And we only have a couple. We have the Frenchtown Fire um, District annexations and a, the Meadowlark storage. Okay, seeing no one come forward. <clears throat> Our current claims list, these are the claims uh, that have come through the Commissioner's Office between July 19th and July 25th of 2018. Total $1,053,372.95. We have two hearings today. The first one is a petition to annex four parcels into the Frenchtown Rural Fire District. And so, um, there you are. We have Sam Scott here from the, the Clerk and Recorder's Office to tell us about the petitions. Um, Sam Scott with the Clerk and Recorder's Office. A petition to annex land into the Frenchtown Fire District was submitted to the Clerk and Recorder. The petition fee has been paid in full. The properties proposed to be an annexed are as follows, all located in Section 3, Township 12 North, Range 23 West. Tract 1 of COS 4488, located at uh, 808 Albert Road. Tract A of COS 3328, less COS 3955, located at 14100 Panther Pass Road. Tract 1 of COS 3955, located at 536 Albert Road. And Tract B of COS 4309, with no physical address. The petition has been signed by property owners who represent more than 40% of the acreage and 40% of the taxable value of the property to be annexed, and a notice of hearing has been published twice in the Missoulian. Thank you, Sam. Is there anyone here from the fire district? Okay, so the fire district has um, signed on to these, so that means they plan to cover um, the properties. Is there anyone here that would like to make public comment? No, that would be me. So okay, yes, please, and state your name. Uh, my name is Richard Wurst, W-E-R-S-T, and um, my wife is Dr. Desity Clark, who owns one of the properties, and it um, is somewhat... Can you talk real close to it, Rich? Thanks. It Thanks. is somewhat irritating to find out that for um, at least the last 30 years, this wasn't included when Frenchtown Fire took over Albertson's Rural Fire Volunteer Fire District. It should have been. But I've looked at property tax records back to 2003, and it's not listed. Bible Lane, which is right next to adjacent, it. I mean, um, is, and the neighbors we have to pass to get to our house are covered. So I'm sure the fire district would accept all, all 30 years back payments if you'd like. <laughs> I'm just that's, being that's not the point. No, it's not the point. They would have always covered you because all of our uh, fire districts when do. The, when the barn burned down, they did show up. The chief is a friend of mine. I've covered the meetings for the paper out there, so I, I know how this works. But I'd like to find out at some point how this oversight happened. And since it's happened 30 years ago, I'm not sure that we can find it, but we can um, we can ask someone to Okay. Do a little I, research. I do appreciate the prompt consideration because our insurance rates were going to go up by five. Okay, so your insurance company has been assuming you were covered, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, that's good. All right, well, we'll make sure you're covered now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, is there any other public comment on this uh, request to annex these properties into Frenchtown Rural Fire District? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and accept a motion. 
I would move that the board approves the petition to annex four parcels located in section three township 14 north range 23 west into the Frenchtown rural fire district as further uh, explained by Sam Scott. Okay, I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, you're in now, Richard. <clears throat> All right, our next hearing is on um, Meadowlark storage buildings for lease or rent. Um, I will open the hearing and ask um, Casey Drayton, our planner, to give us our staff report. Casey Drayton, planner, Missoula County Community and Planning Services, here to present the Meadowlark storage buildings for lease or rent review. Uh, this is a proposal for a new uh, mini warehouse storage facility out at the corner of Waldo Road and Highway 93. The applicant is Taylor Tillman. He's represented by WGM Group, and we have Jeff Smith as well as Taylor here with us today. Uh, as mentioned, we are out at the corner of Waldo and Highway 93, just north of the Y. The subject site is shown with the uh, blue lines around it. Uh, the property recently uh, received an address of 9772 Waldo Road. Um, that was not indicated in the application, and like I said, it's uh, recent addressing there. Looking at the property currently, it's a vacant site, uh, just under 10 acres. Uh, they lost a little bit to the right of way when they came through with the construction, or they currently are doing the construction on Waldo Road there. Um, you can see that it's been used basically as a pasture land or for hay, uh, primarily through history. There hasn't been any development on the property. Uh, these shots were taken yesterday to give you kind of an idea of what we're looking at out on the site that were pieced together. Um, primarily flat for the most part, um, directly adjacent to the highway as well as Waldo there. Um, these contours show the existing conditions across both lots of the Den Blaker subdivision. This would be lot one of the Den Blaker subdivision located to the east. Lot two would be to the west. That was a two lot minor subdivision. Um, you can see the property does slope slightly towards George Cates. Um, it's worth noting uh, the only kind of significant feature on this property that staff's noted uh, with this application and previously is the fact that there is a fairly large culvert at the corner of Waldo and 93 that collects water from the east side of Highway 93 and directs it out towards this property. Seeing that it's been primarily undeveloped in the past, it's never really been much of an issue, except for when it gets down towards George Cates, it tends to collect over there and it's pooled up and created some issues for homeowners uh, over near Malam Meadows. Uh, these are a couple shots that were taken from March of 2017 and you can see that water uh, streaming out of the culvert there and then kind of um, surface pooling across the front of the property. Uh, that uh, Den Blaker subdivision does have a 40 foot public drainage easement uh, within it that runs along the uh, be the east property boundary until about the halfway point where it crosses over towards George Cates. Uh, so that was contemplated to capture some of that drainage. It's uh, estimated that the new construction of Waldo Road is going to capture some of that drainage as well. They're going to have uh, two different ditches there, one between the road and the bike path, and then another one on the side of the bike path. So that should also help out capturing some of the drainage coming out of uh, that culvert there that we see in the bottom of this picture. The Meadowlark storage uh, proposal in front of us today is a uh, buildings for lease or rent review. This would be nine individual buildings, uh, although two of them as shown here uh, are attached um, and they'd have a handful of storage units within each one and we'll get to that breakdown here in a moment. This just gives you kind of a conceptual idea of what the application looks like. The site plan shown here gives you a little better idea of how those buildings are going to be laid out. Uh, the, there are the nine storage unit buildings, and then there's one single family home located down near Waldo Road. Uh, the applicant proposes to live on site, uh, be sort of an on site manager uh, to live in that home near Waldo. Uh, there'd be a small kiosk at the entrance gate, uh, but there's no office type building proposed with this. It'll be managed by that applicant uh, living in the home there. Uh, grading and drainage plan was prepared with the original application that was submitted that we see here. Uh, they're basically proposing to collect all the water and run it back to that detention pond we see at the north of the development area. This is about halfway across that property, so uh, less than five acres roughly of development area here at the southern extent of the property. 
uh, all the drainage would be captured in that detention pond, uh, whether it's being routed down through that drainage easement I previously mentioned or uh, anything coming out of sort of the internal development area. Uh, there's a rendering up top here to show you what it would look like looking back towards the intersection of Waldo and 93. And then at the bottom, we have our unit counts as proposed by the applicant. Uh, the application came in and it actually had one of the unit counts uh, incorrectly labeled. Uh, and that was noticed by an adjacent property owner. So this revised table at the bottom was submitted to give us the true count of what the applicant had originally proposed with the dimensions as well as all the correct unit numbers. And then we would have one single family home, approximately 2,400 square feet, although that number could fluctuate a little bit with a home design that hasn't been finalized yet. These two renderings here, I'll give you an idea of what it's gonna look like uh, from a couple different perspectives. As you can see, some of the storage units are proposed to be sort of open-ended to house RVs and campers. The rest would be your pretty typical enclosed uh, mini warehouse type units. Buildings for Lease or Rent Review looks at a few different review criteria. Um, one of them that you'll find in the staff report uh, first addressed is the fact that this application does fit under Buildings for Lease or Rent Review. Um, there's a handful of criteria that it has to meet in order to be considered for Buildings for Lease or Rent Review, and we found that it, it does meet that, and it does need to go through this review process. Um, we would then look to make sure it avoids or minimizes potential significant impacts to the physical environment and human population in the area. Uh, we feel that with the uh, grading plan, it's gonna minimize uh, most of the environmental impacts here. There's not really any other vegetation that we're concerned about on the property or any habitat or anything like that that uh, has come up in any of the review process. Um, human population is one aspect of consideration. We did receive a comment from the uh, Frenchtown or West Valley Community Council um, that just went to say that this is a lot of uh, storage units out there and there's a lot of nice homes surrounding it. Staff has recommended a condition to increase the landscaping a little bit beyond what was proposed by the applicant so that all four sides of the development would have trees spaced every 30 feet around it to try and um, cut down on the visual impacts to any of the surrounding development there. Um, the development has adequate water, wastewater, and solid waste facilities available to it. Water will be supplied only to the single family home from an existing well uh, that's located up to the north of the property. Uh, wastewater will be handled by one connection to city sewer. Uh, that would go into the single family home there and Republic Services would handle solid waste removal from the site. Access to the site uh, is dictated by the Den Blaker subdivision. There was a no access strip placed around most of the property except for uh, one small area that, and that's where we see the access on the site plan that they've provided. MDT would be the uh, approach authority on that one. So they'd be doing the permitting of that. Um, MDT did comment that uh, through their review process, they'll determine whether or not it needs any additional traffic studies or anything like that um, to, based on the layout of the site. And the applicant has talked to MDT a bit already. So they are in early conversations about that approach permitting. Um, emergency services will be provided to this site. Uh, the Denbliker subdivision did require fire protection. Um, so as a condition of that approval, they would have had to comply with that, whether or not they were here today for buildings release or rent review. Um, so they'll have to do some sort of commercial grade fire protection uh, that approved by the Missoula County Fire Inspector before any building permits are issued for this property. What that system looks like is gonna be vetted out in talks with the fire inspector. I'm not sure if those talks have happened yet or not. The county fire inspector indicated that uh, she had no comment on this proposal at the time when it was sent out. Um, other emergency services such as uh, emergency medical and police protection are assumed to be available for this property. Um, and it complies with floodplain regulations. This property is not on, located within any mapped floodplain area. It was sent to the county floodplain administrator for comment and all he noted basically was the surface drainage that we saw in those couple pictures there at the start. Um, of one note here is that on July 24th, 2018, the applicant did submit uh, an amendment to two of the buildings on the property. 
Um, they proposed this amendment, obviously kind of late in the game, uh, from when the project was originally noticed and sent out. The date we received it, we did post it to the website. Uh, so anybody who may have went there since that date would have saw the revision to it. Um, buildings for lease or rent review doesn't have real firm criteria in terms of um, new proposals or amendments coming forward. So we have it here today for consideration. Uh, it's decreasing the number of units proposed. However, the square footage would go up a little bit. It's basically mirroring units two and three or buildings two and three and copying and sort of pasting them down where buildings in five and six are. Uh, so that would be the storage for the RVs and campers and things like that. Um, and that was based on interest that the applicant had received from prospective uh, tenants, if you will, uh, of these buildings. So staff's recommendation in the staff report uh, was done prior to that uh, amendment coming forward. Uh, we felt that it didn't change any of the criteria in our staff report. However, this recommendation is worded as such that it is addressing the original application. I have a, a separate uh, recommended motion if you so choose to take action on the amended application. Uh, but we're recommending approval of the metal arc storage buildings for lease or rent review subject to four conditions of approval. Uh, the first two are pretty textbook language on receiving the proper permits through the county. The second two have to do with landscaping. As I mentioned, we're recommending that uh, trees be placed around all property lines and it kind of lays out uh, the way in which those would be installed in which we would review a landscaping plan, including irrigation for those trees around the development. And then the fourth condition has to do with any landscaping that's going to be out in the right of way that we would need to see MDT approval for those encroachments prior to approving the landscaping plan. As I mentioned, the amended application motion, uh, we've added language shown in red and underlined there that essentially captures that amended layout received on July 24th, 2018. We did include it as attachment C to the staff report uh, when it did come to you. So that amendment was included on that. So you can reference it as attachment C uh, with the same four conditions there. The project was sent out for uh, agency comment as well as adjacent property owner notification. Uh, we did receive one comment from an adjacent property owner, which you received uh, via email as well as in front of you here today, uh, recommending a condition on lighting. Um, I took that uh, recommended condition that the adjacent property owner uh, put forward and put a little bit of a standard language to the top of it. Um, and that would become condition number five if you choose to adopt it here today. That has to do with lighting. Uh, most of these standards are from the city of Missoula uh, lighting ordinance. Um, I put some definitions down at the bottom in case you had questions on what some of the terms were that are referenced in there. Um, and again, that's all pulled from the city of Missoula. Um, so the basis for that lighting is explained in that letter. Um, I think that adjacent property owner is here with us today. Um, so he may want to speak to it himself. Um, I think for the most part, the condition as I have it written on the screen here follows pretty true to what was suggested in the letter. Uh, again, it just makes it uh, fall in line a little bit better with how you would read a standard condition on buildings for lease or rent or a subdivision something like that. So that concludes my staff report. Uh, happy to take any questions. I do have one for you, Casey. So while we don't have uh, anything in buildings for lease or rent um, that requires this, um, we do have things in our subdivision growth policy to talk about lighting, right? About night light lighting. I mean, we talk about it's preferred, I guess. Uh, I couldn't say if it's addressed specifically, uh, at least through subdivision. I don't believe it's in there and in zoning even. Uh, we don't really have any provisions on We did it in growth policy because I know we talked about viewing lighting. Sky. Growth policy and or comprehensive land use plans may have it. Uh, we have it for signage um, and that's the only specific case I can think of. But I think we definitely support the concept. Yeah. Did you have any questions before we take public comment? No, I know we've talked about even when there's not an interest in zoning in a lot of areas of the county, this would be one zoning district that we've talked about that areas would be interested in potentially because of uh, 
wanting the night sky to stay the night sky. And so, um, and I think it's a good idea, especially when we are seeing Missoula grow and seeing all these uh, storage facilities being built in our smaller communities. It's, you know, it's the gateway to the small communities now is all these storage units. And so I think it's, it's good if they at least try to uh, honor the residential <laughs> people that are living outside the city limits and are living with all of the storage units. Okay, this is a public hearing uh, with the um, person proposing or their representative like to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Jeff Smith with WGM Group here representing the Tillman family. And you have to put that pretty close to you, Jeff. How's this here? That's better. There. All right. Thanks to Casey and county staff for the review of this project so far. I have a, a few items I'd like to cover, and then I'll turn it over briefly to, to Taylor Tillman, if that's all right at this point, to, to cover his family's goals for the project. Casey covered this a bit. Meadowlark Storage is located along the Highway 93 corridor. There are several existing commercial uses along that corridor, both to the north in the area of the Rainbow Equipment sales use, which is... Uh, I, I think we're having ones. trouble picking you up, Jeff. So let's see if we can. You, can, you don't get to turn your head when you talk. Awfully close here. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. So several existing commercial uses along the corridor, both to the. Can I try to this is it. All right. I think I had a short in there somewhere. All right. So there, there are several existing commercial uses along the Highway 93 corridor, both to the north in the area of Rainbow Equipment Sales and then to the south starting just across the street from this site with Jim and Mary's sorry with Jim and Mary's which is just across the street to the to the southeast and then some additional commercial businesses as you uh, as you work your way down to the Y so I, th I think they're not made to turn the head so just leave don't don't tip it all right there we go. That's, That's a much better. better connection there. All right, thanks. So, so Meadowlark Storage is, is situated on Lot 1 of the Den Blecker subdivision. Lot 1 was proposed for commercial uses through the subdivision review and the approval process for Den Blecker. With the subdivision application for Den Blecker, vehicle trip generation for Lot 1 was conservatively estimated by assuming large-scale retail development uh, on Lot 1. A trip generation estimate of 600 to 700 trips per day was included in the subdivision application. Trip generation for a storage use is, is much less than that generated by retail uses. Uh, generation for Meadowlark is conservatively estimated at 165 trip ends per day. Each vehicle visit to the site results in two trip ends. That's one on arrival and then the other end as, as the vehicle departs the site. So the 165 trip end uh, estimate is equivalent to 100, or sorry, to 83 vehicles visiting to the site each day. Casey covered storm drainage a bit. Just wanted to get into a little bit more detail. So storm drainage treatment at, at Meadowlark is, a, is addressed in two ways. First, the runoff generated from the on-site improvements is collected in a, in a piped network and detained in a pond located in the, in the north area of the site uh, before it's discharged in a metered fashion, so we're not discharging any more than the, the existing condition into that existing drainage path uh, off to the west. Secondly, the runoff that, that originates off-site is routed through and around the site. Uh, now it's, it's proposed to be, to be routed along that east side and then along the north through that storm drainage easement. And when MDT's project uh, moves ahead and picks up a, a larger proportion of that, of that off-site runoff, our, our plan, assuming that MDT's work is done before we get to the point where we're under construction, would, would accommodate the, and account for the, the change in offsite runoff, giving some uh, credit to the, to the runoff that MDT is, has taken through their improvements. <coughs> so Meadowlark storage is being designed to fit into this, into this neighborhood. The Tillmans, they're proposing construction of an owner-occupied home along the Waldo Road frontage. 
I've set that home on the, on the frontage to prevent a face to the project that fits with the existing character of development. Perimeter landscaping is proposed along the road frontages, also along the west boundary, and uh, we're in agreement with the proposed condition to include that landscaping and planting along the north boundary as well, so that each edge of this site would be screened. Uh, drive, driving surfaces within the, within the area will be surfaced with asphalt millings. Uh, this is a, a bit different than what was indicated in the application packet. Uh, the millings are proposed to ensure that the site does not generate dust during the high winds that can be prevalent in the area. Lighting will be designed to prevent light trespass and to minimize impacts to the neighbors. Uh, we agree with the proposed conditions of approval as well as the suggested lighting condition as proposed by the adjoining property owner and ask that you consider the amended the amended approval condition as amended July 24th, 2018. Uh, thank you and with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor Tillman to discuss his family's goals for the project. Can I ask you one question first, Jeff? Does, do Millings meet the uh, air quality regs for dust and a new abatement or new road, basically? This is outside of the air stagnation zone. It's just to the north of that. The okay. Millings do provide a, a dust abated surface. Um, there are a couple additional applications, in magnesium chloride or, or other chemicals that can be applied as needed to, to ensure that the millings don't begin to generate dust over time. Okay. They're generally a dust free surface. Okay. Mr. Tillman, did you want to come forward? The light looks like it's green. So I think it's green. Is it? Yeah, this one's a little bit better. It's not as choppy. Um, yeah, just to touch on a few other things for the, the family and I, my mom here and my nephew here today. Um, it was just kind of a, a, a project that kind of came about is uh, we grew up in Frenchtown uh, and Missoula and we're kind of looking for a place to reside that was kind of halfway in between. You know, somewhere somewhere where you're not in Missoula, but just outside, but you're also not where you grew up. And so we picked Hawaii kind of as an area that would be uh, an area that we'd like. And so we were looking for something that we could kind of um, maybe do, a, a, you know, it's with my parents in retirement and something just to, to kind of take ownership of. And so that's how this started as not really being able to find a place for our small little RV. And so within the past year, I just started doing a lot of research on the uh, the business and then the Missoula Valley and ways. And it took a, quite a while to find a spot that would actually fit the specifications that would be um, a good area, good visibility, low impact, but also be like to be a place where we'd like to live. Um, I think um, the most important aspect was, is we're gonna live next to this facility. So um, all the collaboration with surrounding neighbors and I've made oh, up to three visits with all the neighbors in the surrounding area and several others with ones outside of the radius up in Snapdragon, O'Keefe Creek. Um, it was just really important for us to get collaboration with the neighbors because in turn we're a neighbor as well. And uh, the feedback was good, um, and that that's why we were we so we're, we're um, proposing just adding a different building for the RVs. Not that it changes the layout, but we just had so much positive feedback not only from the neighbors, but um, actually, ironically, other storage facility owners in the area um, in Missoula had said that they're actually either they're out of space or they're sending business down the bitter route. Um, and then we're also talking with um, some of the RV dealerships in town we realized that there was actually a, uh, a really high demand. And so that was with the proposed change with the, with the buildings that we just amended. And that was just from a, just that kind of that positive uh, flood of information from everybody, which was very encouraging. Um, concerning the lighting, uh, that was something that uh, was, was very helpful. It came from a surrounding landowner. It was something we also thought of um, because in essence, we're, we're gonna be the closest landowner to the storage. We're actually living on premise and so, as a landowner and also a resident, that consideration was was paramount, and so we appreciated that that comment. Um, I think all those conditions um, fit exactly what we would like to see. It's it's a type of situation where you uh, you want to be able to wake up and look out your window each morning while you're having coffee and feel like it's a place that you're proud of. And so, I think the element of having us live there and having that residence there, I think it gives a whole another dynamic that's more of a, I would say, more of a residential storage area versus a facility. I think sometimes there's a maybe a stigma with, with storage in a way that it's just someone with this, uh, that's going to come in and essentially just uh, either run the place remotely or, or have a manager or somebody but is just in there just um, not as, as involved. And um, we kind of decided that it would be best just to live there, manage it, be a homeowner, be a resident, and fit that into that neighborhood. Um, so we feel it fits the character of the area quite well. Um, 
the only uh, slight adjustment we'd made, and we had talked with Caps and also with WGM, is um, we just uh, when we bought the property, and which was just recently, um, which is a benefit to the storage, is just how busy Highway 93 is. And within the next five years, it'll be widened. Uh, while the road's going to be widened, um, Waldo Road sometimes uh, traffic can back up either six to eight cars deep on Waldo Road as it tries to get onto Highway 93 because it's so busy. So, just one slight um, consideration that we were interested in possibly doing was maybe. Um, on the on on the uh, example up on the uh, for the uh, layout was possibly adjusting the house a little bit more westward towards our west property boundary line, um, just just for a little bit more privacy from the highway. That intersection, uh, surprisingly, when we were out there uh, doing land improvements by fixing fence, it's until you actually stop, you realize how busy that road is. Um, and then also working with MDT, we realized that they're also going to be putting a parking area right at the end of that intersection for the end of the bike path for um, for the use of the, the bike at path and, and between French Town, Missoula, or uh, French Town in, in the Y area, excuse me. Um, so we were, that's the only other thing that we, we, we thought of recently is just trying to make it, design it to where it's, it uh, fits the best for the area. And for us as, as homeowners, it was, it was possibly... Uh, sneaking the house a little bit to the westward property boundary just for a little bit more privacy from that uh, parking area and that intersection. And that's the only other thing that we, um, small uh, alteration that we could think of at this time. But other than that, um, we just feel like it, uh, um, the size and the time and, and the feedback and, and the neighborhood support was, was a good time for us to try and do this and, and uh, really fit it into the neighborhood and get a sense of community as the Y area grows. I think this is an amenity that uh, just increases the, the land values and it increases the, the, the Y area into a place where it's going to be more of a draw, especially with the increase in the uh, amount of residential and commercial use that's taking place and the adjustment to the growth policy and whatnot. So we're just excited as a family to be here and uh, to have this opportunity. And uh, I think we've uh, spent a lot of effort this past year just trying to figure out a way to where it would be the best fit for us to be in that neighborhood for the neighbors and but to also have something that you could uh, be proud of and, and run. All right. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Thomas. Sorry for the long uh, So comment. by moving it west, it means the, in the picture that's on the screen right now, you'd move the house closer to where the kiosk says? That, uh, correct. That the right yeah, one? that was okay. just something within, you know, just the past month after spending more time there, just it's uh, just quite surprising how busy that is, which is, which is great, but as far as from a homeowners it would be nice even though the landscaping's there it would be nice just to be a little bit closer to our western boundary so it'll just be a slight tweak closer to that kiosk and and it's a shorter sewer stub it's just a little bit uh okay. you know less involved but yeah thank you all right thanks is there any other any public comment yes come forward please and state your name Uh, my name is John Vandenberg. I, I have the property that's directly east across the highway from this proposed facility. And a couple of concerns that I have. I notice, according to the plan, that the new owners are only using half of the property. Um, I've spoke with Mr. Tillman a couple of times. He's been up to the house. Um, originally, it was brought across as mom's retiring and we want to put in 10 or 12 units um, to supplement her income. Uh, imagine my surprise when I get the letter from the county and they're putting in 200 plus units. Okay. Um, that being one concern. The other concern is, is obviously if this works, moving north on the highway on both sides, east and west of 93, there is a lot of land that is available that right now is residential. Am I going to be back here in a year when he wants to use the other five acres and put another 300, 400 George users in there that I have to look at? And is that going to change the zoning for that area to where either my property now is zoned commercial or the blank property that's adjoining me gets proposed? Because there is already the gentleman next to me that bought the five acres wants to put his towing business out there. Okay. So. I did not move out of city limits to be right in the middle of city limits, so to speak. And I've got no plans of moving. So I just want to know what kind of things can be put in place to where this doesn't turn into, um, you know, Jellystone Park put in a similar facility for RV storage uh, last year 
up on the hill. And in my mind, the Jim and Mary's Lady Slipper line was kind of the end of the commercial development. And then it turned into the, the Kate's, you know, the nicer homes, the bigger properties, you know, to where you had some breathing room and you weren't looking at everybody. Um, I don't want to stand on my deck and look at 900 RVs under lights at night. Um, just not why I moved out there. So I don't know if it's what the zoning is for that particular property, because it's a, it's a different division than what I live on, but I'm just worried about what that does moving forward as far as the next person that's standing here that bought the next piece of property and the next piece of property and the next piece of property. Um, the commercial area that uh, this gentleman spoke about, you know, it's probably another two miles up the road from me. Um, that was there before I got there, so, you know, nothing I can do about it. But in my particular division, I know that there's no commercial use, uh, not so much the zoning, but the covenants for the, for the subdivision. So, and I don't know what they are on the west side of the highway. Okay. We'll have Casey. Um, could, Casey, are you able to pull up the zoning for the area? Because not a lot of the county is not actually zoned. Right. Right. So, so are you and, basing and then your decisions the other on covenants, or what are you basing that on? Well, so we do have some zoning. Some places are not zoned. And then there's the buildings for lease or rent law, which um, really kind of opens up a lot of um, boxes that we didn't have before. So we'll have Casey explain that for you. Yes, some really good questions. Right. So as you can see in your area. Right where his cursor just was is my house. Right there? Right there. Right. So see, you're not zoned, but you said you have covenants to protect. Right. So the property opposite this, where it's yellow, is zoned. And the big subdivision that was approved by the Williams family is zoned in Lady Slipper area. Right. Lady Slipper and Walder are kind but of But all the off. rest of those are not zoned. So right. I believe anybody could come in and propose a buildings for lease or rent on them, right? Sure, I could just give a little background. So zoning in the county basically stops where these colors stop on the maps that you're looking at here. Mm -hmm. Zoning, which is regulated by Missoula County, uh, it's found in the county zoning regulations, what the permitted uses are, what you can do on those properties. That's all, you know, fairly regulated through county zoning. Where you don't have county zoning, so anything outside of the colors shown here, mm -hmm. it's all considered unzoned property in Missoula County. Unzoned property in Missoula County, some people think is unregulated in a sense, whereas just because there's not zoning there, but there's actually alternative methods of regulation that could come into play. For most of the properties out in this area, private development covenants do regulate uses that can occur on these properties. Uh, the majority of everything to the north and west of Waldo and Highway 93 was uh, divided through subdivision exemption, and it's known as the Meadows West area, Meadows West Homeowners Association out there. And they do have covenants that pertain to the majority of that property. The declarants did reserve some of the pieces, uh, sort of exempted them from residential only type use there. One of those being the original underlying tract that you find there as the Den Blaker subdivision, these two properties. Mm -hmm. So then when Den Blaker came forward and was officially subdivided, they put new covenants down that said, Commercial will be on lot one, residential would be on lot two. Now, I don't know for sure what all the covenants are on your side of the highway, but that's something that's going to be uh, essentially governed by any property owner who's subject to those covenants or within that district. Right. Uh, you could have a homeowners association or something. I'm not sure if you have one or not, yeah. but yeah. Um, they would be the ones responsible generally for right. enforcing well, I, those I understand that they're responsible for my side of the highway, you know, yeah. because our our states, you know, it's single family residential period. Sure. Yep. Um, so like I said, I just happen to be in an awkward spot where you get 200 and some units in there this year. And then he's got another five acres there. The, the five acres at. is certainly open to commercial development potential, mm -hmm. depending on what the applicant was proposing. Basically, at this point in time, he'd be coming back in for another one of these buildings for lease or rent review. Right. Where the county commissioners would have a subsequent public hearing where they would consider whatever the future proposal is in combination with whatever was on the site already. So if that's 
what we have proposed here today is already out there. Mm -hmm. They would take that into consideration on top of whatever the future development right. is. Well, that's what I'm saying. So you know, you'll the be first one's the hardest. So yeah, what so. precedence is this going to set for the rest of the neighborhood to say, well, this guy's got it. And then the next guy goes in and says, well, this, these two are here. And then this one's here. And by the time I get done, from me to Everill Hill is nothing but commercial. Well, and the covenants that are applicable to a lot of those properties up there will restrict that type of use, but I can't say it's applicable to everyone because right. there's so many different sets of covenants and amendments can happen without coming through the, the planning office or in front of the commissioners necessarily. So you could amend covenants, you know, you and your neighbors could get together to allow commercial use on your properties, at oh, which I point if the, <laughs> if the sanitation approved it, you could essentially do that. So right. it doesn't necessarily come back through the county. Another issue is... Um, states that they're going to be hooking into the city water and sewer. Uh, okay. Just sewer. Just or sewer. sewer. Okay. Um, does that create the um, stipulation that I would have to do the same? No. Okay. The, these properties, the two properties in the Den Blake or subdivision are included in the uh, wastewater service area boundary. Uh, your property is not. Okay. Okay, I just didn't know how far they had run it out there. That's so. pretty much it right there, right there. As, as it stands right now. Not to say it couldn't change in the future. But well, yeah, yeah, it can all change in the future. Okay. Do we answer your questions? I mean, the one other tool that um, folks have, of course, most people say, please zone my neighbor's property, not mine. <laughs> we hear that. Um, is there a citizen-initiated zoning? So. Uh, and most of we have 40 some citizen initiated zoning districts in Missoula County. There has to be a minimum of 40 acres um, together. Doesn't need, mean you need to own 40 acres, but you and all your neighbors could ask that the commission um, zone your property. And most of the time they're to zone something out. Right. So you could zone it to say this is residential only. Um, so that's just another tool that's out there, and the sure, planning office sure. could explain that to you if you're. But that interested. affects my zoning, not their zoning. There, you know, that Highway 93 kind of right. But you could get divides folks, the whole thing. So. You could get folks on the other side of the road to. Although I don't know if we can divide with the highway, sure. but okay. Anyway, it, it is another tool. Okay, and um, as far as I know, only access is going to be off of Waldo. Is that yep. correct? Okay, and it's fairly doubtful that the highway department would allow another access you know we already have access issues out there oh yeah i know <laughs> and there is a no access strip along highway 93 okay. except for one small area on 93 and i think that was like a conditional access easement i'd have to go back to the exact language on it but it wasn't designed it was never contemplated really to be access off of 93 right seeing that you have waldo right there as a, a much safer and better access yeah yeah, and they've so, already yeah, that they've, was they've had quite a few accidents on that corner. So yeah. right. um, I've I mean, had to replace my fence almost every year along the highway because people leave the highway and take the fence out. So, And the commissioners did just today send a letter to the Department of Transportation asking them to review and consider reducing the speed from um, Cartage Road all the way to the base of Evero Hill to 55 instead of 70. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's dangerous when I'm trying to get off the highway to get into my driveway. Uh, my wife's been run off the road a couple times because people just assume you're going to take the shoulder and they they don't Keep break coming. <laughs> so, all right. Um, yeah, that's the only concerns I had. Thank so, you, Mr. Vandenberg. Thank you. Commissioners. Uh, I am basically uh, adjacent property owner, uh, probably quarter of a mile away. I got the Jellystone RV park and the Jellystone boat and RV storage. So I kind of know what's going on uh, in that industry. And, and can I, you state your name, please? Yeah, first name is Tom, last name is Malum. And the residence is uh, 10955 Highway 93 North. So right down the road, then also at Jellystone Park. And I got a couple just comments on it. Um, I think when the original proposal went through, this was kind of surprising there, that the, uh, I think it was called for, was it blacktop to start with? Jeff? It was just gravel to start with? Okay. 
where is the cutoff uh, on the dust? Is it, is it Waldo Road? It is Waldo Road. So right to Waldo Road, and then you have to use it. So you're talking about the air stagnation zone? Yeah. So that's where the Air, um, air Quality District has um, jurisdiction. But So the millings will make a big difference, so it's a lot better than gravel, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, we actually looked at some of that also, but you just have to make sure you put the right amount of chemicals on it. And unfortunately, some of the chemicals that get into the groundwater that they use on top of that um, asphalt is harmful. They've done research on that. So that is somewhat of an issue with that. And then the other issue is um, actually building, after building the storage units up there, I guess I just kind of would like to find out for sure in a, in a number, what what at what time will you be turning your lights off uh, at the storage units? I don't know that it says you have to turn them off. What was proposed? I think it mostly says that they um, they're the kind that point to the ground rather than just up in the sky, right? It doesn't say you have to turn them off at uh, nine no, o'clock or anything. There, are, there isn't a provision as recommended um, about timing of that. Did they? Did you put a recommendation on what time to turn those off at night? No. No, that is not in there. I think. In fact, it says that they can't have. It's recommended not to have vapor lights, mercury vapor lights, which those are the ones that turn on and stay on all night. So, you. This yes. would just talk more about how bright they are, where they point, how high up in the air they are, and um, so that it doesn't restrict them, they could be motion activated too. Yeah, the, the issue I have with that is when I built our boat and RV storage up there, I had the lights on and I probably had maybe 30 phone calls from people in the valley, just in the Evero area and then going up Evero Hill. So I worked with the, the neighbors and I made a commitment to them to say that I would turn off all those lights by 11 o'clock every night. Because of the light, it wrecks, it really and truly, I don't care whether they're low, light, low lights, but the, the illumination of the lights um, off the metal will illuminate the whole facility. So I put in and, and made the commitment to turn off those lights at a certain time every night. Um, because I, I mean, I roughly had, like I said, over 30 phone calls, and I dealt with the, the neighbors the right way. And I think this has to be addressed also with the light, the light issue. I think there's got to be something hopefully done in writing or something committed that they will turn the lights off at a certain time um, in those units because you're going to get a tremendous amount of uh, phone calls regarding the, the lighting of the facility with that much metal. And off the, if it comes off those buildings, it's going to, especially living in ranchettes right there with all those ranchettes in that area that farms and that being really the first major piece of parcel there that looks like it's going to be just a light factory. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a good outcome for that. So I think that needs to be addressed. And then the other issue I had is, um, which is really was addressed actually by the person that proposed it was the traffic. That intersection, um, being living there and seeing it, uh, and the gentleman that spoke before me hit it right on the head. There's a tremendous amount of stress on that intersection. And if he's going to put in uh, additional uh, sites that are going to, you know, take 40 or 45 foot RVs now, pulling out of there that are going to put more RVs on that road. Um, with this new amendment that he has put in. That's an extra 40, 45 feet of traffic pulling out on 93, going either north or south, that is going to potentially stress that issue, especially when there's RVs pulling out at Jim and Mary's at the same time. And we have this, we have RVs up, but we're up probably a quarter of a mile, um, so it's not like it's going into each other. But I think that has to be looked at with this. I didn't realize he was putting in a new amendment to put in additional large units that possibly could put more stress on that road. Uh, and that road has already been stressed to the max. And then I don't know if the developer or whoever's going to put 
anything forward if there's an opportunity to, to fund, start a fund with potentially putting in a stoplight there um, with the Ohio Department. If, they're, if they are uh, looking at putting in some sort of a, a fund to fund that light uh, through the development of that area through there, because um, like I said, it's just going to, it's going to continue to just become a hazard and anybody's driven that road can see it's a, it's a difficult situation. I think needs to get addressed. And then I, and I did also talk to the fire chief about it. He has, he was, he had mentioned the same thing that that road is, that intersection is an issue and something needs to be addressed. And with future development coming on, if this gets approved, that, you know, they need to look at the possibility of funding us, funding a, a situation to get a, a specific traffic light in there. And I did talk to the uh, gentleman at, at Copperstone, uh, and he had mentioned to me that they probably have 100 and 130, so I was good to see that those numbers were correct uh, of day use coming in and out of that. They're Copperstone storage units. So they do have similar numbers um, that this proposal sees. Because uh, I know originally some of the numbers were a little skewed on the original proposal, but you got those cleaned up with the numbers and stuff. So I appreciate that to see that. But uh, like I said, and, and I have not talked to this gentleman that's proposing this. Um, so I do have space available at our storage unit. So I don't know where he got the idea that everybody's maxed out. We do have space available also. Um, so there's there's a need for it, but there's also uh, an issue of you know time and when and make sure the proposal is proper and correct. And the other issue too is just one last thing is that I know in these storage units, when I talk to the gentleman at Copperstone, they have a tremendous amount of people that try to live in these units at night. If there's electricity in there, uh, they try to uh, stay there overnight if they're bigger units. And they've had numerous people where they've had to go check it and get people to get out of their units, particularly in the fall and the winter time. So I guess I want to make sure that that's addressed too, that they have uh, guidelines to requirements of people that aren't, aren't uh, overstepping their boundaries in their storage units. Living hey. on site should help that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mallon. Yep. Other public comment? I don't want to break this. Jeff already broke the first one. <laughs> Alan McCormick, uh, representing myself for a change. I have the property that's just to the north of this, 10168 George Capes Boulevard. Uh, and uh, I appreciate Casey's work on the staff report and, and Jeff's work on the application. And then uh, I, I have had the opportunity uh, to talk with Taylor. He's visited the house twice. Uh, and I got also got to meet his mother and nephew. They visited the house once as well. So I've had an opportunity to express my concerns to them. And, and I appreciate their acceptance of the condition that I've, I've offered up for the, the lighting. Uh, I probably wouldn't have thought about the lighting except for Tom's facility. And I have noticed that Tom has, has tried to work with the neighbors. And I do appreciate that. I've noticed the lights turning off earlier and, um, and that, that improving that situation. So based on that experience, I thought, uh, I'm also not so naive to think that, uh, it, that this is just going to be five acres. I assume he's going to be successful. Uh, the clients that I've helped uh, get permits to build these facilities have been successful. And so I, I fully appreciate and assume that the re remaining portion of this property, which is going to take it up to right up to my fence line, will someday be a similar land use. And so I thought I'd better get ahead of this game and, and see if we can help, uh, help allay any concerns. I've known since I've lived there because because of what I do, I study documents, uh, and so I knew this was designated for commercial. Uh, I kind of like the vet veterinary proposal that uh, I think you guys did the zoning for that ultimately pulled out of there. Uh, but this this doesn't bother me. This land use doesn't bother me. And I, th and I think Taylor uh, and his mother and, and family are going to be fine neighbors. Uh, it does give me some comfort level to have them living on site. Uh, what Tom mentioned about people living in uh, their units is what 
partly what prompted the legislature to enact a new storage unit act uh, that went into effect uh, October of last year as specific provisions in there now for how to deal with people who are trying to live in storage uh, unit facilities. Uh, so I, I would I encourage you uh, to adopt the condition that I've proposed. I do like Tom's suggestion about perhaps adding a time in there for turning those lights off. I thought about that, uh, but uh, I kind of addressed it in a way of, of using the uh, measurement of the amount of light at the boundary towards my dwelling as well as towards the west. It's actually going to be a little harder to accomplish some of those things uh, than they might be thinking. I don't want to warn them about that too much, but uh, a good lighting plan, they shouldn't have a problem complying with it, and it should create a situation where they're not contributing too much to the light pollution that's out there. Uh, I, I do have a concern, I share the concern about the dust. And I'm not quite sure how these applications work, but I'd feel a little more comfortable if they the statement in there that they're going to use the asphalt millings becomes a condition uh, just just so that we're all certain it's it's not it's generally not going to affect me because the wind out there blows and it blows every afternoon and every evening a pretty good amount and uh, it's generally from the north west west northwest so it's usually going to come across my property onto him john's the one that ought to be a little more worried about that because he's across the street uh, and so, uh, again, it gives me some more comfort level that they'll live there because if the dust is a problem, it's going to affect them significantly. So uh, there, there, there's reasons for them to both pay attention to the dust as well as the lighting. Uh, unfortunately, we can't guarantee that they will live there forever. So uh, I'd like to see those as, as conditions for this. Uh, otherwise, uh, we support the, the project as it's proposed with the conditions that we've been talking about. Thanks. So, Mr. McCormick, were you okay with the the way that we took what you said and wrote it in a in the condition way? Did, yes. Did you think it was all covered? Yeah, okay. yeah. Casey did a nice job of that, and and yeah, I appreciate that. that I, okay. I fully expected you'd take it in to put it into your own words for that. Okay, thanks. So, Casey, I have a question for you and John, and potentially Alan, since all of you um, deal with these more. Do we have the uh, authority or um, in buildings for lease or rent to add a condition saying millings because of the adjacency to the, the um, air stagnation zone? Yeah, I think based on the testimony here today, we, you have full freedom to add conditions to it. Um, you can condition the approval as we've recommended and beyond that. Um, after, you know, finding that there's a need for that condition to mitigate, I think in this case uh, impacts to the physical and uh, surrounding neighborhood. Um, so, I mean, it can be pretty bare bones language on that one, just that drivable surfaces need to be constructed of asphalt millings. Uh, so I, I or don't asphalt. see any issue yeah. with that. And or, then yeah, my other asphalt. question is in regard to, um, I'm not sure whether it was Mr. Mell or Mr. Vandenberg talking about the intersection. Um, do we have the authority through this this section of law to um, add a, a waiver for future intersection improvements that they could contribute if the rest of the neighborhood based on benefit? My guess is there's probably a waiver statement on the Den Blaker plat already uh, for future road improvements, um, which would capture the lot owners here. Okay. Um, I don't know about adding an additional statement to this um, on that basis that because uh, I know MDTA has plans in the future to do a an improvement all the way from Evero, but um, there yeah. is going to be a day when there's going to be need for some sort of traffic um, control there. Yeah, so there is a, a waiver statement on the plat okay. for lot owners of Den Blaker for, and it has Waldo included for, um, including but not limited to paving, curbs and gutters, non motorized facilities, drainage facilities based on benefit. Uh, the waiver shall run with the land and shall be um, binding upon transferees and successors. Standard okay. RSID Good. waiver language on there. So there we know that. At some point when that happens, they'll be contributing just like everyone else in the neighborhood. Correct. Probably more than others in the neighborhood that don't have that waiver on their property. Yeah, and not a lot of the property north of Waldo. Uh, very little of it's been through a true subdivision review. Right. Any other questions? 
I guess um, I'd be curious how Mr. Tillman or Smith feel about the time on turning lights off and that being actually included in this language or, you know, what your thoughts are on that. We think that's a good idea to include it. Okay. So could you pull up the, um, the lighting amendment that you had or condition that one? So... I think you're the most amenable applicants we've ever had. <laughs> Lost it. Do you have some suggested language, Casey? Simple. Um, you know, because you would, you may with, want lights that turn. Like if somebody happened to go in at eleven o'clock, you might want motion lights to come on. But what would you call? And with any of this, just keep in mind that everything on this condition is what we would be looking at essentially at on a, a, a lighting plan okay. and something we can approve prior to the building permit. Once you get into something that is like turning them off every night, yep. it could quickly become a sort of a compliance issue. Um, but, you know, we can do our best to keep an eye on it. Just keep in mind that the timing is a little bit different than what we're looking at here. It, it'd be similar to if they went in and added lights after the fact that weren't indicated on the plan and compliant with these regulations. So uh, it's definitely doable to add it. it. It does become difficult, though, just for the record to note that, that, you know, we we have to verify complaints that come in and things like that. So, it, so are you recommending that that maybe be included in the lighting plan, but that we keep our requirements for the lighting plan as is? Or I mean, you could add something that the... In the lighting plan, the applicant would have to essentially declare that they're going to shut all the lights off by 11 p.m., and that would give us a, an enforcement mechanism should we verify that lights are on past 11 p.m. at night um, to go back to the applicant and say, here's the plan you provided, we approved, and here's your noncompliance with that plan. So give the neighbor something to fight it with, I mean, to have as Yeah, it's certainly doable. So we'd just add another simple line that said... Lighting um, should be... The plan shall indicate that lighting shall be on no later than, I think Tom mentioned 11 p.m. at his facility. Was that correct? I don't know if there's any it other It looks like John has an opinion. No? No, no opinion. I, I know the expert. Okay. Just because I know we have your, the enforcement ability, we have run into issues with certain things where it's difficult to enforce, but... Yeah. Just a, just a quick comment on the lighting. Uh, it, I guess it kind of depends on which lighting. I, we totally agree that um, with the requests of, of Alan and everybody on the, the lighting being intrusive at some times, but I guess in the language, I guess it would be important to, like you said, with Casey said, specify what specifically on the lighting. There is small downward facing lights on some of the buildings that are on all the time that are not the ones that I would say in question are problematic. Uh, I think the ones Tom Malmer referring to, uh, since his facility is actually up above the highway, uh, and it's a lot more visible, um, which does make sense, is the uh, lighting that is inside a storage shed that shines down, which is obviously more prevalent at Tom's facility. But it would, it would, I guess we would be interested in when we interpret the language of lighting, um, does that include an entire black out of the property? Uh, taking into account, per se, if this was five or six houses, that would have a significant amount more light that would not have the same restrictions. So I guess... We're in total agreement to thinking that the light should be addressed, but like I said, I think we need to take into account what what that what that means as far as the entire property. Um, obviously, uh, we, we, like you said, light intrusion uh, is important, but I would just recommend that we would maybe you know talk about that language as far as what that means. But we're we're totally agreeable to that, but just not sure when we say everything's off at 11 p.m. Does that include small? Uh, downward facing lights on each building that are pointing down not upward not outward with a certain wattage um, you can tell with most storage facilities even around that some of them have a minimal amount of what we'd call safety lighting on the property which would be the equivalent of a um, low wattage barn light if someone had a agricultural or a set of outbuildings um, so i guess that would be my only concern with lighting is what what that specifies when we say everything off at 11. Um, and that's my, my, my only comment on that. But uh, everything else seems to make total sense as far as what that would be. Um, Do you have any ideas of how to word that? I mean, I think that we can make it kind of flexible knowing that as we look at the lighting plan, I mean, I was thinking about 
something about time of day and lighting would not impact the neighbors with somehow, but I mean, you, you some might, neighbors could be a pain in the neck. Alan sounds like he's going to be okay. <laughs> you might be able to achieve it by lights over a certain height or, or something. I don't know if your kind of security safety lighting is maybe below 10 feet or something. It might be much less obtrusive than if you have like a, if it was pole mounted or way up on a gable of the end of a building or something. Right. I think, yeah, the ones where you're usually on the buildings, in which most of them are going to be eight and a half to nine feet. The, the large RV building would be upwards of, of 15 feet. Uh, but one of the conditions that we had seen in there that their lights wouldn't be any higher than 20. So um, the lighting would be downward facing um, on, on certain buildings. I think the ones that um, people would be most concerned about or would be considered floodlights or lamps. Uh, to where it would uh, illuminate the place like a parking lot, which is completely undesirable and something we would we uh, as oppose as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I think we could, we could very intuitively incorporate this lighting plan into the design to where um, it's not intrusive, fits the conditions that uh, Alan had mentioned, and um, fit into the neighborhood. I just I don't know how we would word that, like you said, to where that wouldn't be restrictive in a way that down the road that becomes problematic if, like you say, someone is on premise and grabs something at, at midnight or something like that and, and leaves and then there's an issue we, if they hit something. I, I'm not sure. There's just a minimal amount of safety and lighting that would probably be on the building still, but again, those would be very minimal. Um, so it's just something we would, I guess, have to address that way maybe a little bit. And, and I also think that because you heard here that Mr. Malum has told you that people will call you if your lights are offensive, <laughs> gives you a good reason to come up with a good plan. Yeah, which 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 was very, uh, that was very encouraging to hear and have that suggestion to have Alan do that work to suggest those conditions which would which, which would fit the property um, nicely. So I appreciate that legwork by Alan doing that and, and then Casey um, transferring that into that language. So um, it does make sense um, for sure. And uh, we're, we're definitely sensitive to that. Okay. Any other ideas or comments? Mr. McCormick. Alan McCormick again. Uh, when I wrote this, I was I was trying to find the balance between not being a jerk and also uh, not being affected by his lighting. The ordinance for this gets way more complicated. Uh, both the ordinance that the Missoula City enacted, as well as the um, Oh, the engineering standards, they actually have a more sophisticated method, but I couldn't understand the mathematics behind it, but there's a way that you kind of calculate the total lumens for a site and the use, and then you adjust. And I told Jeff, I said I wasn't going to subject them to be the first ones to figure out how to do the mathematic calculation for that. So I tried to come up with something different. But there is something I think that might help that we could add into this. So just, I don't know that we can do it sitting here. I don't want to delay their proposal, but one of the aspects that um, the city of Missoula has is there's an obligation at a certain time of night to dim the lights. I think it's a 50% reduction in, this, in the lighting for certain uh, commercial and industrial applications or, or parking lot. There's some parking lot standards that say after a certain amount of time, the amount of light has to be reduced by 50%. So there's probably a way to accommodate where a, a good chunk of these lights go off and then the ones that need to be there for uh, some safety aspect get automatically reduced by 50 percent and all that lighting the technology to do that is readily available so i just throw that out as as one of the ideas that we could look at and figuring out a way to accommodate what we're all trying to do so and i guess I, we just need to decide do we need to write it down or did these folks hear things and they can kind of figure it out too and put it in their lighting plan okay. mr malum yeah uh tom Malum once again um, on those on the lights mine all do face downward so they're not in the sky that's originally why I put those downward and to have those off turned off between 10 30 11 every night um, I th I think if you if you do not put a condition of approval tied into the lighting situation it's a slippery slope you got to figure some uh, condition on that where I'm, I'm just telling you from experience you have to address it because when people drive that 93 road and they see that reflection off those metal buildings and I don't even if the lights are turned down they're still going to be off the metal um, they are going to reflect off there and the neighbors are 
are it's going to be a it's it's going to be a problem. But I think if you don't address it within a condition that there's really no way to uh, implement the law if you don't address it with some sort of a time frame where I mean really and truly people really shouldn't be out in their mini in their storage units at 12 o'clock at night anyways <laughs> I mean if they're out there coming through the facility at 12 o'clock you probably don't really it's probably not the best thing to have anyways but I think if you you know put a condition of approval with a certain time basically you know work with the time frame I have no problem with motion sensor lights if something does come off come on then there's you know they go on for a minute that's great. Motion sensors, security lights are great, but the ones that stay on uh, longer than they should, with the illumination off the metal buildings, it will, it'll be, it'll be a problem. Thank you. Ideas, Casey. Uh, I was just going to first note that the way we have this condition five proposed condition written here is that it's for all outdoor lighting. So keep in mind this covers the single family home as well as the storage units. So I just want to make sure that whatever you're putting on this, I don't uh, want it to end up with a, a time and then have uh, the applicant out on his porch at 11.05 p.m. and have the neighbors calling because he's got a porch light on. If we just said it had to be total blackout, you know, that's pretty restrictive with the house on there, too. So those could be separated. Uh, you know, you could remove the home from the condition. But... Uh, in terms of the time frame, it becomes difficult as well. It gets dark at different times of the year. I don't know if, if lighting's less obtrusive at 6 p.m. in the winter when it's pitch black as opposed to 11 p.m. in the summer when it's pitch black. And then we would also have to look at the alternate end of that as well. When does lighting, can, you, can it come on at early morning hours if it's still dark out, which a portion of the year it is. Um, so like I said, it it is kind of a difficult condition or amendment to this condition. It, it can be done if... Uh, you so choose to add that on there we can drum up some language if you have some parameters that you're thinking of ideas have we put the these restrictions on any other building for lease or rent not that i know of uh the majority of buildings for lease or rent is storage units and i it was i don't think it was on the last one at least that i was looking at pretty closely for a template here and that's out uh near french town so a rural setting again where you do have a lot of residential development in close proximity it's at the the mobile home court out there um but uh i think this this condition as worded is much further than any lighting condition we've gone into on uh, subdivisions or zoning or anything like that even so it's fairly restrictive in terms of what we generally work with um, so it's something to keep in mind as well well and is it since it says that you have that caps will review and approve the lighting plan um, do we need to be very specific about that or give you direction that we would like to see well, a lighting plan would identify the fixtures. So they would identify a fixture that's a full cutoff and say, this is what I'm going to put, and this is where I'm going to put it. And it's not going to distribute light in any way that's more obtrusive than what's allowed there. Mm -hmm. So that's something we could review for. If we want an additional element of that plan to specifically state times, we would have to be pretty clear about that here today, or else we won't be looking for that when the building permit comes through right and I think that we're interested in specific times but wondering about the specific language that we don't feel comfortable constructing on the fly um, and if we could give direction as to times if then you could work with the applicants and come up with some some better language by the time in order to approve it or mr. Smith looks like he's got Sorry, I, I think we have some some language that that might work for everyone um, to come up with it on the fly and add as a last sentence to that condition five so if we if we Restricted lighting above 10 feet after 11. So all lights above 10 feet in height were turned off after 11 o'clock. And any lighting 10 feet or below was dimmed to 50% of its luminosity from a period from, we say, 11 o'clock until when's it a good time in the morning for you? I guess it depends on the day. You know, I mean, but it's going to be dark by any means because sometime early morning. From 11 until 7 a.m., or sorry, 11 until 6 a.m., I think. So how about if we um, adopt what we have here and just know that this is what we talked about. It's kind of where we're going, and 
we think you guys are going to come up with some great language that's going to be a model going forward. To, because, I mean, it, you're right. It, right now it's, it's light at 5 o'clock in the morning, but in the middle of the winter it's not light till 9 o'clock. So, you know. Yeah, I'm just a little hesitant of uh, amending a condition, having staff amend a condition at a later date. That was a condition adopted at a public hearing by the commission. Well, I don't think we need to amend the condition. I'm just thinking that they're going to have a good plan. That that's, talks yeah, about that. That's what I was saying is having have it addressed in the plan with direction from us, but not having it specifically outlined in the condition. Yeah, I mean, you could add to the condition just that the plan shall address at which hours and which lights will be turned off or something. And then we'll look for that at least to make sure they've at least volunteered that. It doesn't put those firm standards on it. So what'd you say the plan will address? Something simple there. Which hours apply to which lighting, I think is what he said. Yeah, it's not good I, enough. I mean, it can be, if you want to keep it general, as simple as that, that the plan will at least indicate so that we have something to, to review for. Do you have the um, ability to type today on there so they can see it? Mr. Tillman. Uh, yeah, thanks. I just well, I want a chance to make one more comment. Yeah. Um, you know, just as we're all talking, I think we're all in agreement in the neighbors that this is an issue that we need to address. Um, I guess um, it was also suggested there's always a dusk and a dawn uh, type of um, mm -hmm. time frame to also adjust. I, th I think based on what we've heard today, and, and in a way, I guess it, we, you know, we uh, we're all in agreement that also being the landowner there, I think this is going to be um, kind of a, a discretionary matter to where as a landowner that's, that's heard these comments and is also uh, already complying with language that's already uh, um, been addressed in these conditions, I think um, you could have confidently assume that based on that, that as, as a landowner who's in the closest proximity to those buildings, that we're going to be the most exacting on when we would probably want to have things dim as well. Because I think in addition to the landowner, other landowners, I mean, we're also – and that's the advantage of being on site and being a resident there is I think we can take what we've heard today and work with these conditions to where it, at a, a discretion of either a dusk till dawn and like Casey had mentioned with things in winter and summer hours, it becomes a very, in a way to the, to the reverse, actually a slippery slope the other way to where it's now you're, you're in fear of not being in compliance with something that's very ambiguous. So I think based on these conditions that were set forth already uh, and also the, uh, uh, we appreciate Tom uh, Malum's um, experience, and I think that's uh, that was very important to hear that. I've heard that from uh, several of the landowners. Um, I think as we can, uh, at our discretion, based on those on those conditions, f comply and 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 also work, you know, forward on this to be, um, you know, very. Uh, um, successful and creating an atmosphere and through experience what what is the most um, you know amenable to the to the lighting um i just like you said it's in this it's in those five details that we would we would just wouldn't want to um be in non-compliance or in trouble in in some way if if, if if like casey had mentioned there was some situation that wasn't was just a little bit out of bounds or in an ambiguous you know um um, classification. So, yeah, we're, 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 we we do like those um, so um, conditions. You, do you see the last one that he just typed? Would you? I would think that we'd want to say each fixture type, maybe, so that it doesn't have to say light number one, light number two, but rather ten foot lights or something. Yeah, and I think the one that um, that, it, that it, would be workable. Yeah, and I think the one that we're that we're I think all of us are, and especially Tom are referring to, is when you have a. Uh, Essentially, it's a roof and two sides. Essentially, it's a canopy style RV shed as opposed to completely enclosed. All the enclosed ones just have that minimal downward facing. You know, it says this is A, this is B. It's that one. It's eight feet that sh shoots down. The one that Tom's referencing um, that I think has been exacerbated by his position on top of the hill is any lighting that shoots down inside that the corrugated metal shed down on that is 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 pretty bright. So I think those lights there are the ones that we're talking about and the most in question. Um, is, is, is those downward facing um, uh, fluorescent lights. Um, the safety lighting that we're talking about on the edge of each uh, building and lights that you'd have on your house and porch lights, I think those ones are out of the bounds of what we're speaking about. And Tom's definitely referencing something that would be more along the lines of a commercial light uh, inside that large canopy building with the RVs where it would illuminate the entire um, set of um, 
occupied RVs inside there. Um, and that's the one I think that we would be the most sensitive to because that would, as you mentioned, be bright. And so I think that's where we could definitely use our discretion and then follow these guidelines to work with that. Okay. So that last sentence, the plan shall include, indicate the time frame in which each fixture type will be illuminated would give you the flexibility to include that in your plan, right? I think so, yeah. And that timeline would probably have to be based off experience and, and with the seasons, what is the most effective. And I think most likely that's probably going to follow a dusk to dawn type of time frame, just like with, you know, hunting hours or something like that. You just, I think that it's going to naturally fall into that to where after some experience, I think it's going to be pretty apparent which time frames are going to be, yeah, it's it's dark, it's it's, it's in the morning, it's time to come back on as traffic starts up in the morning type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. And then, um, Casey, if we wanted to um, add the asphalt millings, where would we do that? Uh, that would just be condition number six, um, which would be worded something like all drivable surfaces shall be constructed of an asphalt millings or asphalt surface or, okay. or you could say asphalt millings are better but uh, you know I don't know what I don't think they're going to put concrete down ever so asphalt or asphalt millings are probably your only realistic options there okay are you guys comfortable with that yeah there, there's other options as well as long as it's not a loose road mix gravel um, the asphalt millings are, are rolled hard there's also crushed concrete there's there's several uh, other contractors we're working with that have a surface that's hardened and then rolled and then mr tillman we probably need you up, up the mic just because we record these sorry about that so so the um what kind of wording would you suggest then uh it's it's as long as it's not a loose gravel surface so i think would cover a majority of it um talking with several contractors our, our our preference would obviously be asphalt but asphalt's very expensive um the next best thing would be a recycled asphalt which is is hard rolled uh, and eventually turns into the consistency of an asphalt because of the heat and the petroleum still in the product. So these asphalt millings actually become very compacted and actually is a is a I'd say a lesser version of an actually paved asphalt. Um, other contractors are suggested based on a price, possibly a crushed concrete. Essentially, in the language, I think we would just look to say that as long as it's not loose gravel in our consumer, with even a rolled loose gravel would be potentially dust. But I think anything beyond a loose gravel. Um, crushed asphalt or recycled asphalt, crushed concrete, or um, there's possibly even other combinations that uh, contractors in some of the, the knife rivers and western excavatings and shadow asphalts have that they use, which would they would use in these type of situations, you know, for dust abatement and that sort of thing. So I guess with the language, it would just probably be as long as it's, I think what we're everyone's thinking in their mind is, is loose gravel that when the dust kicks up or the wind, you have that little dust dust cloud. Could we just um, say all drivable surfaces shall be improved with a surface superior to loose gravel for dust control? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I that, mean, it, that would encompass anything better than gravel. For right? sure, yeah, and, and, and that's true. I think loose gravel would, with those winds, I, especially our house is actually directly below the units, and so we would be actually be one of the most affected. So it's, it's in our best interest to have something that's going to be very permanent, very hard, because um, those winds are, like Alan said, they're a west and a northwest, and we would actually take the brunt of that. So, yeah, for sure, it's in our best interest to have that. Okay, for dust control, the other word is fugitive dust, right? So which one is the right word? Does it matter? Fugitive particulate. We don't want those particulates getting away. Dust control, fugitive particulate. Or we could just end it after loose gravel. Get rid of the. I mean, the record reflects that we're talking about dust, so. Sure. Yeah, okay. And we'll make sure that gets into the, the findings for the approval letter. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, was there anything else that we. The waiver's already on there, the asphalt millings, and the lighting. I think we got them all. Okay. Is there any other public comment before we move on to making motions? All right, I'll close the public comment portion of this hearing. Okay, um, I'll start by making a motion to add a condition of approval number six that says all drivable surfaces shall be improved with a surface superior to loose gravel. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
I will also move that we add a condition of approval number five that states that all outdoor lighting proposed shall be represented on a lighting plan which shall be reviewed and approved by CAPS prior to issuance of a land use permit meeting the following requirements. All light fixtures shall be equipped with full cutoff optics as defined by IESNA, Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. Light fixtures shall not be installed higher than 20 feet or the height of the storage buildings, whichever is less. Where the property borders a residential use, north and west, illumination at the property boundary line may not exceed 0.5 vertical foot candles, the amount of light measured on a vertical surface. Light fixtures shall be oriented to direct lighting downward and away from property boundaries adjacent to a residential use, north and west. Lighting that is oriented upward, strings of lights, and mercury vapor light fixtures are prohibited. The plan shall indicate the time frame in which each, light, each fixture type will be illuminated. I'll second the motion. So I just have one question. I like strings of lights in my yard. Does this apply to, should we add, except in the residential? Are we talking like the kind that everybody has now the little uh -huh. costco <laughs> ones the i barbecue. mean does that does that mean that uh you know i, I don't I mean know we could add a line thing. saying that this doesn't apply to the i mean you could house. amend that to say all outdoor lighting exclusive of the single family dwelling proposed shall be i mean okay, that would so take the house out of all of this though okay uh, i amend my amendment to say that so the very first line would say exclusive of res the residential? So yeah, the first line would say all outdoor lighting exclusive of residential, of the, of the residential, residential use. use. Okay. Okay. Shall be represented on a lighting plan, okay. et cetera. All right. So I will second that. So we'll just, uh, even though technically we should vote on the exclusive use first, we're going to vote on it all together since we haven't, <laughs> since it's brand new. So all in favor of um, amendment number five as amended? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then we just need to go. So our motion reflects. Um, in attachment C and now as amended today, right? Oh, do we need to um, reflect anything about the um, change in the the one building type? That was the Are you, revised layout, I think. Yeah, you're referencing the revised oh, right layout. There. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's the motion. Okay. Subject to the following conditions. Okay, they're all there. Okay. All right. Uh, so I would move that the Meadowlark storage buildings for lease or rent project on lot one of the Den Bliker subdivision as represented in the applicant packet and amended by the revised layout received 72418 included as attachment C to the staff report and as um, additional amendments five and six or conditions five and six added today be approved based on the findings of fact and conclusions of law found in the staff report subject to the following conditions of approval as well as five and six. One, a land use permit shall be reviewed and approved by the Community and Planning Services Office prior to construction of the buildings for lease or rent. The buildings shall be in substantial compliance with the plan submitted in the applicant packet. Number two, the building permit, a building permit for all new buildings shall be reviewed and approved by County Public Works Department prior to constructions of the building for lease or rent. Three, Landscaping for the development shall be completed in the following manner. A plan for planting location shall be submitted to CAPS at the time of land use permit application showing one two inch caliper tree along the east, south and west property lines and along the north edge of the drainage easement for the full extent of the development area with no more than 30 foot spacing between planted trees. All trees shall be served by adequate irrigation which shall be identified on the landscape plan. Installation of the landscaping and irrigation for the entire development shall be completed within one year of issuance of the first land use permit. All landscaping shall be kept alive and replaced if necessary. No additional permits for the property will be issued until a visual inspection of the landscaping is completed by CAP staff. Number four, for any landscaping proposed that encroaches upon the Highway 93 or Waldo Road right-of-way, a certification from the Montana Department of Transportation approving the landscaping shall be submitted along with the landscape plan. And then additionally, we already went through five and six. I'll second that motion. I have one question. Um, uh, Mr. Tillman asked uh, about the placement of his house. This says sub insubstantially, so we, we don't have building envelopes or anything, so all of these buildings could move a little. It's just substantially, right? Yeah, I mean, it's assumed that when they actually pull together construction documents, there might be minor changes. If he came in with additional buildings, a total rearrangement, additional units, something like that, it would kick it back to 
buildings release or rent review. If the house moves west due to whatever issue may come up, um, then that would just be looked at as, you know, a minor construction tweak that those things do happen. Okay. I just want to make sure because we hadn't addressed that after he asked. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. It's been approved as amended. Thank you to everyone for um, helping work through all of that. Is there any other business to come before the commission? Seeing none, we're in recess. Excuse me, did you have a question? Yeah, on that uh, topic. Are there any um, signage conditions on the property? There are not signage conditions. Those will be controlled by, I mean, we... There are some sign uh, regulations like about how big they can be and um, the highway department has some, the county has some, like I think you can't have a sign bigger than 32 square feet. That's off site. For an off premise sign, we have regulations on unzoned property, but not for on site uses. There is not a, a sign code or anything. Okay, so I think that Mr. Tillman's probably hearing that you don't want a great big old flashing yellow sign across the street from you. Okay. <laughs> and um, would you like, um, we just recycle these packets. Would you like one of the packets? Here you go. All right. And we are in recess. Thanks. Here's the additional stuff that he added. So. Mm -hmm. Everything but not signs. Yeah. Huh. They talk about walls. 